All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll get started here. Uh, I've got uh, this video I'm gonna put on uh, YouTube later on. So if you, you have people you wanna share that with or um, later viewing, I know there's a couple of details I picked up on this here that I'm gonna write down because I missed it the first time after someone said it. Uh, this is a pre-recorded webinar. So uh, live, ver this is the live version. So I'm here <clears throat> kind of narrating some of these things, but I went out and gathered some information because I'm, I'm a naturalist at the outdoor campus in Rapid City, uh, but there's plenty of experts throughout our whole building that I wanted to uh, tap into their, their knowledge. And so I've got a few biologists uh, as well as a law enforcement officer all contributing as well as a habitat biologist contributing to uh, this webinar. Uh, we're just got an hour long. Um, any questions that you have, put them in the chat. Let's let's try that first. Make sure we can all uh, enter things in there. Uh, that that way they're all in one place instead of the chat and the Q and A. <clears throat> uh, as far as the overview goes, I've got a little bit of some e scouting going on. Uh, I did some screen sharing with that and walk through. Uh, some different things with with uh, how I use use uh, digital maps, and then we have a lawn. Or I also have in there some gear preparation, very minimal, but just a couple little tidbits. And then uh, we've got a law enforcement officer uh, talking about some of those mainly forgotten rules and regs that we need to know about, and then uh, a biologist talking about the EHD and CWD. Uh, concerns. Uh, that is probably one of the highlights there with the EHD. Talked to a rancher today that uh, asked permission for myself to go hunting and he, he said, no, not this year. Uh, we're losing deer left and right. So that's a localized spot where there is an issue. Other spots, I was hunting with a uh, hunting 101 participant today with their apprentice tag and we saw tons of deer in a couple of really nice bucks. It looked like EHD wasn't even a thing. So, and that was probably um, 10 miles, five miles down the road, uh, not very far. So there's uh, very localized areas where that, that EHD is causing issues. So uh, how the biologist talks about that is, is pretty helpful. And then uh, the next biologist uh, talks about uh, down some of the timing of the rut. And I, and I thought that was very well said and, and some good information. So make sure you have your pen ready for that part to write down some of those dates because I'm going to certainly do the same because I didn't get it the first time. Um, <clears throat> I apologize, there is a little delay in the audio. Uh, so maybe just don't watch it because it'll drive you nuts. Listen to it. <laughs> uh, watch that first part with uh, the e-scouting part. You'll get to. You'll need to see the map portion there and the the gear stuff. But after that, just listen. Uh, if that drives you nuts, don't tune out. I want to make sure you're all there. Uh, but uh, that that has to do with the file transfer thing. I can't fix it. Um, and then I'll put this on YouTube later. I believe I said. And all right. So um, again, any questions you have, put in the chat. Uh, share that with anyone that uh, you think could use it. And we've got a variety of um, things for, for new folks getting into hunting, as well as uh, a couple of things for you've been doing this for a lifetime. So there we go. All right, everyone, thanks for tuning into this webinar. And uh, just like all hunting, some of the preparation involves proper gear. And I don't want to spend a lot of time going through gear. We all know it's in our hunting pack, but just a couple little things, little reminders, a couple tidbits that'll help you with some of that prep as you're packing things up. And the worst thing is forgetting something. You don't want to be out in the field and realize you don't have this or that, or uh, maybe it's a legal thing that you don't have and you run to the store or you gotta wait till uh, you gotta run, run to Rapid or run to a bigger town to go find a store that has something. So that can be a pain. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to make sure, one of our most important, probably our firearm, um, make sure you know your firearm, where it shoots, how it shoots, 
and the ammo that you have. And I know we have a big ammo shortage going on right now, so that makes things a little trickier. Ammo is not ammo is not ammo. You need to realize that a Winchester 243 100 grain is going to shoot different than a Remington Corlock 100 grain. Up to maybe six inches difference or even more. And that's a matter of a miss at 200 yards. So make sure that you have shot the ammo that you have found. A lot of us probably have, aren't shooting the exact ammo that we really, really want to be shooting because it's hard to find. So make sure you buy that ammo. It's starting to show up on some shelves a little bit more. But make sure you grab that ammo and go shoot that ammo so that you're making good, clean, ethical shots. Make sure that you're and everything's tight on your scope. Uh, it's not fun to get out in the field and realize you're missing a part or uh, your Allen wrenches aren't tight or uh, something is not working there. So give your gun a little quick clean before you go out so that you know everything's lubed up and ready to roll and that you have the proper ammo. Also, uh, I really, really enjoy just a simple day pack, but something that you can at least strap a quarter to the outside of the pack. So this small day pack has a frame to it. It's got waist belt. You've got to have some waist belt, so that's going to take the weight and get it off of your shoulders. And then have something that has some straps that are going to be able to wrap around a, a deer quarter. And you could actually put almost an entire deer, if you plan this out right, quartered out on this little old pack. So that's that's something that does work uh, if you plan that out right. So inside here, a couple things I really encourage you guys to look into are uh, trauma kits. Uh, something to, when the worst case scenario happens, you have it. Uh, a first aid kit and survival kit. We teach some classes here at the outdoor campus and other outdoor campuses, campus in Sioux Falls that are survival and, and different classes like that that you can uh, check, figure out how to, how to gear yourself up for that emergency situation. These are things I don't really dig into very often or ever, uh, but it's there knowing and giving me peace of mind that if something bad happens, I got it and I can take care of the situation. Also in there, a little rain poncho and uh, matches and all that that go along with my emergency kit. Inside my kill kit, I have a couple of different knives. This is your kind of preference thing that have a fixed blade that I really like, as well as a replaceable razor blade knife that is also pretty handy. It's nice to have razor, razor sharp, and it's also nice to have something that's a little bit better at doing some skinning. Both orange handle, that's on purpose, so that when I set them down, I don't lose them, so that's handy. Also in my kill kit here, I have some gloves. It's kind of nice to keep your hands kind of clean. Also some ear protection as well as more blades if I need to. Here at the Rapid City Outdoor Campus, you can grab these little tag punches. Kind of a cool little thing that uh, helps you tag your, uh, put your punch in your tag when you're all done. Kind of a fun little thing to add to the outside of your pack. And then on the inside here, uh, if you are planning on hiking even more than a mile, a mile uh, game bags are kind of nice. Uh, anytime I'm further than 500 yards, I'm probably going to quarter something out. I don't like dragging. Dragging is not very fun uh, and it's a lot more exhausting than actually quartering something in the field. I'll attach a video in the link or right here for you guys to see how exactly you can do the gutless method or other quartering. Uh, just make sure that some of those pieces are away from the road. It's, it's kind of unsightly. You don't like to see that. And then also uh, in an area where that's okay uh, to leave those parts behind. Um, if the landowner doesn't want you to leave carcass stuff behind, he wants you to take the whole thing and just leave the gut pile, uh, that's, that's a common practice as well. Also in there is flashlights, I have multiple as well as spare batteries, uh, extra, extra ammunition, water bottle, warm X, and the only other thing I'm going to throw in here is uh, some warm clothes just for various weather types, and uh, some food. You've got to have some snacks. Binoculars and a harness is really great. Just like in the law portion you're going to see here in a little bit, binoculars are really important. You need to be using these instead of the, the scope on your rifle. That's not safe whatsoever. So using your binoculars uh, as well as a range finder is very useful to make sure that you make an ethical shot you know how far something is away. Uh, our orange requirement, got to have some orange as well as you're hunting. 
Uh, and this is something I also wanted to add in here. Decoys are great, but hunting using decoys during a rifle season has a level of risk. So know that that might not be advised. Uh, lastly, we've got a couple things here. I uh, used this the other day with some uh, supported hunts. Just a little cut up piece of sleeping pad. That saved us. Sitting on just a little bit of frozen ground uh, really kept us a lot warmer and keeping some insulation between me and the ground. Uh, and then a bipod there's a, or tripod. There's a couple of various ones from very cheap and simple to a little bit more extravagant. And it's nice to have a more solid rest. More solid rest, the more accurate and more ethical shot you're going to take. All right, so in this section, I kind of wanted to look. All right, I, I told you I was going to put a link in the video there. Um, sorry, just kidding. Uh, but what you need to do, or can do, is to type in South Dakota Game Fish and Parks in YouTube. And there is a Packing Out Big Game Part 1, I believe a Packing Out Big Game Part 2 there that uh, Chris Hall, our communications guy for the department, Put together so again south dakota game fish and parks packing out big game uh, or another one to write down if you look up the gutless method there's 20 different ways of doing it and they're all all great so uh, again sorry audio on this one is a little louder so maybe turn that down if it seems loud and then turn it back up for the biologists so sorry i'm not a audio engineer did my best on that so here we go look at some e-scouting techniques and just looking at a couple of different properties these are by no means any certain properties i don't have a single waypoint showing in this area so tells you right there i know nothing about this area necessarily but i picked an area right along the belfouche river uh just because i know this is an area that's a pretty popular deer hunting area uh, all private here that's of course important to know you can't just access any of this without permission uh, this mapping software on x is wonderful for that but also just like uh, what officer decker is going to say here is you need to ha use that that walk-in map or the hunting atlas to make sure but anyway let's get rolling so along the river if we're looking for white tails any creek bottom river bottom is going to be one of those places that we're going to be looking for uh, as well as the egg fields associated with that oftentimes there's going to be uh, the deer out in these fields during the evenings coming off of them uh, in the morning going onto them in the evenings and so you may be able to look and try and find where those little travel corridors are where they come off there uh, as well as maybe uh say take a look at this guy's property um i bet you there is some level of change here uh, our hybrid showing topography may or may not show it oh yeah looks like there's a little bit of a dip in there but looks like you could set up right here and be able to look down into some of this these trees uh if you were sitting somewhere i would really really not want to go diving down into it blowing an area out this is where e-scouting comes in handy i can now just mark out and see okay my effective range is let's say 350. all right so i'm gonna if i sat there i'm gonna be able to shoot anything that comes in a majority of that area so uh this egg field maybe that's i i can see where the deer are at or maybe there's i've scouted that there's not a lot of deer that visit that but i do know the deer are going to be bedding in this thick timber lots of cover right in here so that that might not be a really bad spot to hunt um i'm sure it's a great spot to hunt but obviously we have no connection to these landowners so don't go reaching out to them necessarily because you don't know anything about them uh but they would be moving through that area maybe sitting up here would allow a little bit more of a shorter distance maybe a pinch point so looking for pinch points are really really valuable if you're able to hunt on some of these pieces of private um, but moving on uh, other pinch points and things uh, that you may find include spots like this where it's real wide comes together right in there uh, the big thing to keep in mind is the wind direction and where you should be could be placing yourself if 
we had a south wind when going this way uh, coming in this direction and going in there is probably not the best option you may want to access up here and make your way down that way with the wind in your face you must must have that wind in your face or at least a crosswind uh, keep in, um, in mind of where that wind's going so right now we got a 25 mile an hour uh, northwest wind so it looks like if I wanted to access this point I'd be coming in from the south same piece of property giving it different attention based on what uh, what the wind is and weather is doing all right in this spot uh, another random spot obviously you can drive along this road here uh, and this is a piece of school ground that is accessible to hunt uh, and know that maybe quite a few hunters would be accessing just not far off the road uh, and if they're looking from the road they can probably see up with this straw they can glass that one but that little pocket probably can't see uh, so if I were a hunter I may walk right up that ridge and be out here waiting for and be there by daylight that's a that's what this uh, e-scouting allows me to do maybe map out a route so i can take my marker and i'm gonna map this route out oh, didn't mean to do a shape I meant to do a line but same thing uh, map that route out so I know exactly where my spot is that I'm going to be sitting looking over that draw right there that no one can see necessarily from the road. I can also then see oh man there's all this stuff from the south there this big long draw maybe they're moving up and down through that uh, and and you can see down into that maybe from there you can glass into this area so some of these western larger chunks of property you require a little up and over and down and up a few of the nasty stuff and that's what these apps and things are wonderful for using is trying to find those little areas where you can see or gain some find some of those access points there's another little access access point there's an access point to this area here's a little access point pretty small uh this one right here doesn't look like you're going to see a whole lot of anything from the road um without getting up and over you know it looks like you're probably up on top of that first one but you're not going to be able to see any of those opposite draws there uh so that one's that one actually looks a little tricky to hunt because you gotta go up and down up and down just about any, everything but maybe that deters some other hunters so that might be another spot to check out all right now lastly i picked a, a another different type of spot say i'm hunting whitetails and i'm up in perkins county here uh i bet you a lot of this is mule deer country out in that big wide open prairie but i'm sure there's still the whitetail occasionally um maybe along the grand river and i'm can speak i've never even been to this unit area uh so i'm i'm speaking totally out of assumption based on what i'm seeing here but if I'm looking for a whitetail, I'm probably wanting to go to that river bottom and looking for some of this, this nice thick cover, uh, these travel areas. And in this spot where it is very, uh, access is, is blocky, um, this is where that east scouting is going to come into to handy. So it looks like there's a lot of nice cover in here. Uh, so any of this access here, mm, that's a little tricky it's it's pretty narrow uh looks like to get to some of that is going to be pretty long walk which is just fine uh oh there's a road right there looks like maybe you hike right out to here oh and you can kind of see that river bottom that might not be a bad spot to um to look at and i know this is this is a standing rock reservation so probably not some place that most people are going to hunt or can hunt uh, but there's some walking areas right in there so similar uh, that that is open um, so right there we get that road here's a walk in and you can see that creek bottom sometimes you got to remove the layers here because that makes reading the topography a little trickier uh, but maybe this topography is right here where i'd be looking for whitetails versus out on some of that rolling prairie whitetails check those river bottoms uh, mule deer we got to make sure there's some that prairie but and some breaks 
but also looking for some egg fields, maybe some egg fields here where the, the mule deer are coming off of and into some sort of cover. But I bet you along this, any part of this river, there's some quite a bit of deer uh, where they're a little more concentrated. If you get out onto the prairie, a lot less concentration of deer, but uh, you can work for it, you can find a good deer. All right, for this portion of our West River Deer Hunting webinar, I've got uh, Conservation Officer Chris Decker uh, hey, to chat with us a little bit about some of those commonly uh, forgotten things when it comes to the, the handbook and some of the regulations. So what are some of those big things that you see out in the field? Big things we're, we're seeing this time of year uh, start out is just trespass issues, knowing where you're at. So Onyx is an amazing tool. I use it all the time uh, at work, but nothing beats the old hard map. So I get out a paper map and I double check where I am on my on X, make sure I'm in the right spot because you can't always rely on your GPS signals. Sometimes they're wrong, sometimes your phone doesn't update. So look in two places, know where you are to make sure you're in the right place. Uh, walk-in areas too may go in and out of walk-in. So sometimes. Absolutely. So, you know, our paper atlas map, you know, it's printed uh, middle of the summer is when we start cranking out those prints. So come fall, we may have some walk-in areas where landowners chose to take it out of the walk-in. So double check with our online version. And if you show up somewhere and it says walk-in area on the online version, shows it in our paper as a walk-in, but you don't see those walk-in area signs, call your local conservation officer and double check. Sometimes those things can come out and we don't have time to update those online maps. And our paper ones obviously aren't gonna get updated with all those changes. So another time that you may be tempted to go on some places that you don't have permission on, besides not knowing where you're at, mm -hmm. would be say you down, you got an animal down. Uh, so walk yeah. us through, we shoot a deer, jumps across the fence that we can't go on. So big game retrieval is different than small game unarmed retrieval. So small game, you're road hunting or you're on private property, you have permission to be there. Small game drops on private property, you don't have permission for, you can leave your gun behind and you can walk straight out to that animal and get it and come right back. Big game's a different story. So with big game, you have to have landowner permission to go out there. So it's very tempting to leave your gun behind, go out. I mean, that deer may only be 10 yards into someone else's property, but that's a hunting trespass. And it's a knowing trespass at that point, which can carry a revocation of your hunting privileges for a year. So you don't want to jeopardize that. So yeah. ask permission from that landowner to get out there. If you need a mediator, by all means, give a conservation officer a call. I can't make someone give you permission to go out there uh, or allow you out there to get that animal. But always ask, always get permission because you don't want to get caught with a trespass charge. Uh, other other things we've got to make sure we got in, got in mind, some safety things. Uh, are blaze orange requirements? Yeah, so blaze orange, uh, unlike small game hunting, it is required for big game hunting when you're rifle hunting. So you have to have one piece of blaze orange clothing above the waist, visible from 360 degrees. So I love hats like this that are blaze orange all the way around. Really good. A lot of times guys are coming out and they may just have that blaze orange front on it. Not an acceptable piece of material. It has to be blaze orange visible from 360 degrees. Or, you know, a nice vest that works great. A coat, a jacket. I prefer vests because you can put those on over your lightweight clothing or you can put it on over your jacket. What I'll see guys do is they may be wearing a really nice button down shirt that's blaze orange like you have on right now, but it'll be blaze orange. Well, when it gets cold later in the evening, they'll throw a jacket on. Well, now you can't see that blaze orange from 360 degrees. You might only see it up front or it might be zipped up. You can't see it at all. So I like a vest because you can put that on over anything. Right, or even throw it a pack on. Exactly. Yep, you can throw it right on your pack and you, you've you got that. I also like to hang something off my pack. Again, my desire level when I'm big game hunting to get shot is zero. Yeah. So I like to have a lot of blaze orange on. Absolutely. So I do that. Another thing I want to remind people, keep your hunting handbook handy. That's going to answer a lot of your questions for you. Um, when you have questions about tagging and transportation requirements, dive into here really quick. Make sure that you're tagging your animals right away. When you get out to your career, punch that tag out. We've got our new punches that uh, you can get at any of our offices that work really good for punching out your tag. Make sure you sign it, you punch it, and securely affix it to your deer. That hind leg, or if you have a buck, you can now attach it to the antlers. What are some of those common safety things that you see? Maybe it's not necessarily a regulation deal, but just making sure people are safe. What, what are some reminders that you can tell these folks? 
basic gun safety. I mean, that's what I want to harp on. So always keep your muzzle pointed in a safe direction. That alleviates almost 100% of the incidences that would happen is if your gun's pointed in a safe direction. Making sure you know what's in front of and behind your target. And then don't be using your rifle scope as a set of binoculars. You got a set of binoculars. If you don't have a set, buy a cheap set. But don't be using your rifle scope. Mm -hmm. Nothing aggravates me more than having a scope pointed at me when someone's trying to use that to figure out who I am when I'm out there yeah. you know, working in the field. It's uncomfortable. It is very uncomfortable. And that's a great way to get a talking to by me. All right, so we chatted with uh, Steve a little bit about uh, some EHD things, and so we're seeing uh, some deaths from EHD going on. So there's there's going to be, on some places, a few dead deer here and there. So what are some things that are going to come up with that? So if you're finding a bunch of dead deer, first of all, we'd like to know about it, just so we can uh, have a pretty good idea for our population, our herd assessments, uh, because that's going to affect our tag allocations, potentially, and I'm sure Steve talked about that. Mm -hmm. But if you're finding those deadheads, so when I say a deadhead, I'm talking about a deer with the antlers still attached to the skull, laying out there dead in the field. You cannot legally take that out of the field and possess it. Now, if you're a landowner, you can move it and get it out of the way so you're not running over with a four-wheeler or running over with a tractor, because that gets expensive in a hurry, and we understand that. But you know, if you're out there hunting on the national forest, you're out there hunting on private property you have permission for, those deadheads have to stay there. I know some of them are gonna be beautiful, some of them are gonna be some trophy class animals, but they have to stay there and be a part of the environment. All right. And anything else we have? No, I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, sounds good. Thanks for your time. And if uh, you guys run into any issues in the field, uh, you guys cover a big chunk of ground. So you guys are the eyes in the field as well. If if you see things, get a hold of the any of the conservation officers how how's the easiest way to find any of their numbers you guys numbers so the easiest way to get a hold of us uh, there's two really easy ways so if you want to get a hold of your local officer you can look in our hunting handbook and we've got our numbers listed in there so look for where you are and look for that local officer if it's after hours it's late you can't get a hold of your local officer call the tips hotline if you see something going on that needs to be reported and that's 1888 overbag so call the tips hotline get some good information Get a license plate if you can, or a good vehicle description. We can work wonders with that information. Mm -hmm. Again, remember, we're paid to go out there and confront individuals who are committing wildlife crimes. Get a bunch of good information and get that along to us, and we'll go out there and do our best to close those cases out. And just go out and have a lot of fun this fall, and we look forward to seeing you in the field. All right, I'm here with Trenton Heffley, one of our wildlife biologists, and uh, a little longer title than that, so you can <laughs> introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, so I'm Trenton Heffley, I'm the Regional Terrestrial Resources Supervisor. Um, long title, but basically I deal with uh, wildlife species and wildlife habitat. So uh, we got, it's late October right now, and uh, as it, when this goes out, and we'll have West River deer season coming up here. Uh, in November, three weeks in November, starting on the 13th, 13th, 13th for three weeks, uh, and a mix of those, those that in that season, we've got people with some any deer tags, so they are able to harvest a mule deer or a whitetail, or in any whitetail, uh, any antlerless, or you know what yep. I mean. So species specific. Um, one of those things that you hear a lot of folks say is, is uh, they have a, any white tail, maybe they struggle to find those white tail. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about a herd outlook, kind of the concentrations of where those deer are, those different species. And, yeah, you bet. Yeah, I've definitely been in that boat. You show up with any white tail tag on opening yep. day and you start beating the hills down and all you see is mule deer. Um, so, you, you know, in almost all of our units in Western South Dakota, we have a pretty good overlap of mule deer and white tails. You'll never know what you're gonna see. But generally speaking, what, a lot, what has allowed the expansion of whitetails is agriculture. So if you've got a creek bottom or some sort of irrigation or water source where a farmer is providing some sort of a cereal crop or alfalfa, something along those lines, that's going to be a little bit better spot to look for whitetails versus heading up into the Cedar Breaks of the Cheyenne River. Um, certainly you're going to be whitetails in that country, but if you have one of those whitetail specific tags, probably going to be better off looking for some kind of agriculture. Um, even a, a hardwood creek bottom is going to hold a higher density white tails than just a, a wide open prairie. And then we were saying that you can be hunting that kind of country, see mule deer all day, and all of a sudden there's a white tail. Yep. You never know when a big old buck's hanging out in the middle of mule deer country, so yep. you can get lucky. Uh, so uh, 
throughout the month of November, um, what's the deer activity look like typically? You know, that might change year to year, but in general, from maybe late October now, we've got a little lull in their activity. How's that progress through the month? Yeah, so interestingly enough, you know, we've got whitetails and mule deer, both black hills and prairie. Um, through a lot of our fawn research where we're catching newborn fawns, what we've seen is there's actually a pretty distinct timing separation from whitetail rut, uh, which translates then into whitetail parturition when they're having their fawns. Um, so whitetails on the prairie are gonna be really similar across the state. About that first part of November, first seven to 10 days, they're gonna be chasing hard, they're gonna be breeding right after that. So our West River deer season this year, November 13th, probably gonna catch the very front end of that whitetail breeding. Sometimes guys call it a lockdown you might see uh, mature bucks tied up with those, maybe not running quite as hard as they normally would, but give it two, three days by the you know 15th, 17th of November, you're gonna see those whitetail bucks up and running hard again. Um, Black Hills generally add seven days to it. You know, our, our, our partrition on whitetail fawns on the prairie was about seven days, seven to 10 days ahead of our partrition in the Black Hills. Uh, mule deer then push into the last half of November. We're gonna start to see increasing mule deer activity, you know, 5th of November, something like that, whereas whitetails would have been, Halloween is kind of a, always a good day to be in a bow stand if you're a bow hunter. Um, starting to see the whitetail activity end of October, first part of November, mule deer bump that back about a week. Our West River deer season uh, is a great 16 days. You're gonna definitely catch a good portion of the whitetail rut and you're gonna catch a good portion of the mule deer rut. So our, our West River season dates really hit both ruts about head on. Perfect. So mark your calendars. Right. Some good days to know. <laughs> All right. Other opportunities. All right. So we uh, have our three-week season here, uh, but there are some other opportunities to fill some tags, and I do believe there's even a few on the leftover list uh, still available. But go check that out. Uh, tell us about the later antler list season. Yeah. So you've got your 16-day West River deer season. Um, any license that we issue for West River Deer is valid during that 16 day period. And then we also have, um, we, we reopened our nine day antlerless extension. So that's gonna open, it's a little bit variable, usually the second Saturday in December, runs for nine days. Uh, the kicker with that season though is it's not all tags. You can't go back out and shoot a doe on your any deer tag. So if you have a type 01 any deer or a type 11 any whitetail, those tags unfortunately are no longer valid. It has to be a tag that's specifically limited to antlerless deer. So a okay. uh, type 19, a double antlerless whitetail, those would become valid again for that antlerless extension. Okay. And, and in some of those areas where we know there's some deer issues, some of those landowners really appreciate you harvesting your doe tags. And, and we've got some of those units that have in West River specifically lots of doe tags, even up to three for one, one application. Uh, Speaking of that, the landowner relations that go with that, talk to us about some of the things that we can keep in mind as we're in the field interacting with private landowners. Yeah, so 80% of South Dakota is privately owned. So you could definitely have great opportunities on public land, um, but it never hurts to try and knock on a door. I mean, tags are valid on public and private land. It's gonna open a ton of additional opportunities if you're willing to go talk to a landowner. Um, you know, unfortunately now, late October, there's still some opportunities to go try and find landowners, but really this is something you should be thinking about in March or April. Um, start early, build a relationship with that landowner. Really what we what we hear from landowners a lot is a, probably the number one complaint is opening day, somebody shows up at my door is trying to get permission to hunt. Oftentimes that landowner is looking to hunt himself or they're kind of busy. They don't want to deal with something in mid-November when you're trying to hunt with them that day. Get out there in, in March or April, even before you apply, before you know you have a tag, let the landowner know that you're putting in the effort, you're putting in the work ahead of time to say, hey, I'm trying to build this relationship. Before I even apply, I wanna know that I've got a spot to go. So that's a, a great time. Um, and then one thing we hear too is let them know. You know, a landowner's letting you out on their place. They're just as interested as you are in, in what happens. So if you got three guys that go out there and have a couple of buck tags, a couple of doe tags, give them a call after he's all said and done and say, hey, had a great time, shot three bucks, saw a bunch of deer, you know, super appreciative of, of what you allowed us to do. But um, yeah, it, it, it's all about building relationships. Landowners are people too. They like talking with people. They like interacting with people. So yeah. get out there and talk to them. Yeah. Are there any things that you personally like to do when you're 
that you keep in mind, say uh, the gates, and how do you pay attention to whether you should drive out there or not? Like, what, what are some of those just general things all, you think about? All of that stuff is, they're great questions for the landowner, you know, the, the initial conversation you have with the landowner. Um, oftentimes a landowner will say, you know, all my exterior gates are closed, so if it's closed, close it when you go through it. All my interior gates are open. That's a, a good way to kind of figure out if you're on the right property or not, or if you're leaving the right property. Um, so generally, good rule of thumb, leave the gates as you find them. A lot of landowners aren't gonna mind if you drive out to a deer once you shoot it. That being said, this year we've got some pretty significant fire danger. Probably not a good oper not, not a great thing to be driving around on prairies right now this time of year. Um, yeah. But up to, up to the individual landowner. A lot of guys will ask you, just stay on my two tracks, walk a little bit if you have to, or let me know. I've got a four-wheeler or a mule or something. We'll get that out there. We'll get your deer hauled out for you. Don't want your truck driving all over, but we'll figure out some way to drag your deer out. Yeah, it seems like every landowner is just so different. Some want to be part of every little bit and wants to drive the tractor right out to help you out. And some will yep. just have at it. We'll yep. see you next time. Right. So there's everything in between. So, uh, But keeping those landowners' uh, connections are pretty important because we have private land that's accessible in the walk-in area. So uh, maybe that's what we're talking about, the, our walk-in program that we have, and that that's not public land, that's private land. There's a lot of work that goes on behind that. Is that? Yeah, so you know, what was our, our both our walk-in hunting access program and our chat program, our controlled hunter access program, that's that's privately owned land that that landowner is gracious enough to allow some sort of public access. We, we as a department pay them for that access. That, that money is provided through uh, uh, hunting license sales and uh, the surcharges on hunting licenses. But yeah, just like you would with normal private land that you get permission right. for, treat that like private land. There are some additional restrictions that uh, you have to be aware of when you hunt walk-in area. Um, and you, one thing we haven't talked about is, you know, what do you do with your carcass or your guts or that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to see gut piles or carcasses, rib cages, boned out legs next to roads or parking lots. Keep it back over the hill. Um, with all the CWD regulations and everything, we as a department are encouraging folks to leave it where you shoot it, but try and get it over the hill. Try and get it out of sight. We don't need people driving by looking at a bunch of deer carcasses on the side of the road. It gives hunters a bad name, might burn a landowner. So yeah, just always be thinking about that kind of stuff. We're here with Steve Griffin, one of our wildlife biologists here at the Rapid City office and wanted to talk with you a little bit about some of the, the disease concerns and things going on, especially this season. We have some uh, attention happening around EHD. So explain what that is. And yeah, so um, this year in particular, um, epizootic hemorrhagic disease is a disease that we probably have in South Dakota every year. Um, some folks call it blue tongue. It's really hemorrhagic disease. Um, EHD and VTV are the same thing. It's just a different varieties of the virus. Um, again, we have it probably every year in some areas of the state. This year, it just seems to be a little widespread, more widespread across the state. Um, some areas we have concern um, with the number of deer that we are losing. One thing to keep in mind with this disease is that it is generally a white-tailed deer disease. So we've, we've estimated about 1,250 documented deer that have been reported, and about 1,230 of those, are, or 1,210 of those, I should say, are actually white-tailed deer. So very few pronghorn and mule deer have gotten the disease or been documented with the disease. Um, but they can get it. So it's generally a white-tailed deer disease. Um, Do you see any patterns of age or sex related to it at all, or is it pretty across the board? So when we say white-tail, um, let's just stick to white-tail because that's what's hitting. Um, a white-tail is a white-tail. Male white-tail versus female white-tail, they're all the same. They're both susceptible. Generally, it'll hit older age. The, the fawns have a little bit more immunity to it because they've been on mother's milk a little bit longer. Um, so sometimes you'll see more fawns running around without mothers in some areas, but uh, it'll hit the bucks and the does the same. Um, some folks will notice the, the bucks more often and think that all of the bucks died and not the does. They're dying at the same rate. 
depending on where the virus is. Um, let's talk a little bit about how this virus is spread. It's spread by midges, biting flies, midges, noceums, things like that. So if the virus is present in the environment and these midges have the virus, they will bite the deer, give the virus to the deer. A deer cannot give the virus to another deer by itself. A midge has to bite that infected deer and bite an uninfected deer and then it transfers it to the other deer. So it is spread by the biting flies, midges, noceums, etc. Um, the way we get rid of this, and hopefully by the time you guys see this, we will be done with it, is that we get hard frost everywhere, which kills off the, the midges that are carrying the virus, and we'll be in great, in great shape after that. We still could lose a few deer because of the, they have the virus, but for the most part, it'll stop the spread of this disease. If we're out hunting and we, maybe one of the deer just gets it in this later season, I'm not sure how long that takes for symptoms to show, but what are some of those things you might see in the field come this November season? So generally by November, we're gonna be done with this disease. Um, the disease, the virus is very fast acting in most cases. Two to five days, these deer are dead. Um, they basically bleed to death internally. So you're not gonna see a, a sickly deer generally out there with EHD. Again, they can have symptoms of the disease later, but the majority of them die or they live. Um, if you harvest a deer, just so you know, if you harvest a deer, hemorrhagic disease does not affect humans at all. So you do not have to worry about a deer having hemorrhagic disease at the time of harvest or anything like that. Cook your meat to 165 degrees, just like you normally would, and you have no issue. Again, EHD virus does not affect humans at all, or if you think about it, we get bit by noceums also in some of these areas, we do not come down with that virus. So it's not an issue for humans. Uh, yeah, I do wanna mention a couple other things with EHD, just, just to let hunters know. We have pulled back leftover tags in certain areas where we know the virus has hit hard. What we would recommend to hunters is go to our website, just type in EHD and this, hit the search button and hit EHD and click on the map, should pop up right away, find the EHD map, click on it. You'll see where the disease has been documented, um, reported to us, documented, and then the, the, there'll be black dots and red dots. The red dots are actually confirmed positives across the state, wherever we have found it. So you'll see the distribution. And the important thing about that is, is that if it's in an area where you generally hunt, we want you to call your landowner if you hunt on a landowner, ask them if they've been um, affected by the EHD virus and if they've lost deer and if they still want you to come out. The important thing there also is, is that you can turn your tags in before the season starts and get a full refund and your preference points back. And that doesn't just include for EHD, but that's for any reason that you, you have. Um, you can do that. Um, Black Hills deer hunters has not affected the Black Hills at all. So all of you Black Hills deer hunters out there that might watch this or hunt both West River and Black Hills, you're good to go in the Black Hills. Just look on the prairie is basically where you gotta see where the, the effect of this disease might be. And you can always call your local conservation officer, local game and fish, offices, um, but most importantly, call your landowners because we don't know exactly what's going on on every piece of land out there. Okay, so uh, CWD is something that we've talked about plenty of times, but uh, this year we have a couple new new considerations thanks to uh, regulation for transporting, um, yes. but talk to us about concerns of CWD in case people have not hunted and experienced that, that before. So chronic wasting disease, most of you are aware of what chronic wasting disease or have heard the term. You can go to our website again, um, just type in CWD in the search thing and it'll bring you up more information than you probably want to see. Um, it's caused by a prion, it affects, to, it affects basically whitetails, mule deer and elk um, in the state of South Dakota. CWD has been documented in, I believe, every West River County except for four. Um, so we have found it in, in most of our West River Deer counties and one 
East River Deer County, Sully County. Um, we have a, a system set up this year where, and, and those, these hunters will be getting a letter, is we have a high surveillance area where we want to collect samples. So you will be getting a letter and that's generally along the river this year, um, on, on mostly on the, the west side of the river where we want samples from hunters to see if the disease is over there. Um, again, just go to our website, you can get all the information you want or, or get a hold of one of us and we'll, we'll clarify that. Um, the big thing that we changed, the commission changed this year is our, is our carcass transportation and disposal regulations. So they've changed from last year. And in a nutshell, it basically states that if you harvest a deer in any county and remove that deer from that county, any pieces, parts, except for the meat from that county, the deer has to be thrown in the landfill, i.e. the carcass, the bones, the, the any unused part has to go to into landfill. Um, that's the main thing that hunters need to worry about. If you take it from, let's use an example, if you hunt in Harding County and you take that deer to anywhere else besides Harding County, then it has to go into a landfill. If you take it to a processor in Sioux Falls or anywhere East River or in Rapid City, for example, that processor by rule now has to throw that meat or that tissue away, not the meat. Um, so that's really focusing on people not throwing it out into the field that yep. the coyotes get it. There is evidence that we can transmit this, this, this prion through carcasses if we have it um, from an area where we know we have it, you take it back east, throw it out back for the dogs or the coyotes or whatever, then there's the potential that we're transmitting this disease over there. So we want it to go to a landfill. You can process your deer in your county or wherever you harvest, do the gutless method, however you want to do it. If you take just meat away, you're golden. You don't, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, so just look, look at those regulations. Um, if you're, if you're bringing an animal from an out of state coming into South Dakota, same thing. You can do that, but it has to go in a landfill. Those parts have to go in a landfill that you're not consuming. As far as testing, we're concentrating on the stuff along the river, but any hunter that wants to get an animal tested can look on our website, find the sites of drop off, um, contact their regional offices, set up an appointment, and will surely help you get a sample collected from your animal to send into the lab. So everything we send in is free of cost to you and you will get the results one way or another. Perfect. Well, thanks for your time. Okay. And again, uh, these, these guys, the biologists are always open for, for questions and yep. we'll gladly chat with you. Absolutely. Just give any regional office a call or your, talk to your local conservation officer. Hi guys, we're here with Austin, one of our habitat biologists. Hey guys. Hey and uh, going to talk a little bit about some of our hunting tactics when we're looking at uh, hunting out here on the prairie. Uh, the Black Hills area, we're not focusing on too terrible much today, but out on the prairie, uh, chasing mule deer, chasing whitetail. Okay, all right. Well, congrats to everyone who drew a tag this year. Um, I guess what I always like to start off with is um, uh, just doing some scouting online. Um, check out that unit that you got your tag for. Pick out a few public spots that you'd like to check out, and then um, that saves you some time once you actually get to that unit to hunt. Uh, you kind of already have an idea of where you want to go and check out. And, um, so, I, go ahead. Yeah, so like uh, if we got an uh, any deer tag, let's start with our any deer tag, yep. and that obviously gives you the options of running into yep. whatever you want. And, and besides having different goals, we all have different goals when we're hunting, and that's maybe the big mature buck, or it doesn't matter. Antlers, yeah, fill the freezer. Yeah. Uh, so despite that, uh, we got an any deer tag. What are some of your tactics going into uh, finding a, a mule deer? Okay. Um, best thing to start off with is you would want to get to a vantage point, get somewhere, get up somewhere high, uh, try to get in there before sunrise, if you're able to. Get up high in glass, uh, it's going to be your best bet for finding either a mealer or a whitetail, really. But just spend a lot of time behind your glass and um, try to pick apart the landscape and uh, find that deer that you're looking for, or whether it's for the antlers or for the meat, regardless. And 
that's going to be your best best bet for finding an animal is getting up high in um, an area where it has good habitat. Um, you got water, food, and cover. Um, that animal should be in that area. Um, it might just take a little while to pick it apart. You're not always going to find them right away. It can take some time sometimes. But so if we're out looking at a piece or if we're east scouting ahead of time and mm -hmm. it's we're well into October already, November it's coming up here pretty quick so there's not a lot of time to, to go find that permission uh, or you got to do a lot of that now yeah, right now definitely. Um, so what are you looking for in mule deer country what kind of terrain uh, vegetation cover what are you seeing um, I'd like to, I like um, open areas that could have breaks in them your, well, yeah, mule deer, you're going to be in like uh, your your breaks and kind of out on the, sometimes they're just out in the wide open. Um, they're a little different than whitetails. All right, so what are some of the, the differences in whitetail? Um, whitetails, you're going to find primarily around your, I mean, you'll find mule deer around your egg fields too, um, around rivers. Um, but those whitetails seem to primarily hang out around their egg fields, um, alfalfa fields, food plots, uh, and then along like the river banks. Uh, that's where they're mainly going to be around. You're going to run into mule deer too in those areas, but uh, I feel like you'll find more whitetails in those areas. Um, so when once you've uh, you've located for. Uh, obviously from there a location you're putting on a spot in the stock yep we've spotted them now we're stocking in okay. uh, using our terrain yep getting maybe that use those lower train almost like your animal drainages and, and yep. use those drainages to get within range because it's easy to see a mile or two uh, but say we haven't found any places and it's the, the spot we haven't no, found any deer but we want to sit like a morning and an evening sit where we know we want them to move through what do those spots look like first? Okay. Uh, and then we'll get into something else. Okay. Um, so if you're if you're gonna go sit somewhere in the evening, you're gonna wanna sit in kinda like a natural funneling uh, in the landscape where deer are gonna utilize that area to funnel through to get to food, um, water, um, or to go from bedding to food to cover. That's one thing you can sit over a water hole uh, if it's really hot out. Um, you could sit on a food plot. They're all going to be things that the deer are going to be utilizing either in the mornings or the evenings when they're moving from their bedding to uh, food to water and then back to bedding. Um, you can sit a ground blind tree stand. Um, you can be mobile and just stay on your feet and uh, sit at those areas and that way if you need to you can chase after them and um, get into position for shots so i would imagine and what i used to do quite a bit as a kid is sitting over the shine river or yeah. sitting uh over the belfouche if you got a spot on there yeah. whatever river or creek it is even some of those smaller ones sitting on a little area that you can see maybe both sides or whatever you can hunt and, yes and being able to see where those those deer are going to move through yep yeah a bad place to sit if you got some patience and exactly Especially uh, opening day. What's uh, opening day seems to be maybe a little different tactic than what yeah. you do on the last day. What's yeah. what's your opening day game plan? Opening day. Um, once again, I like to be up high. I like to be able to see um, see things moving around. You're going to see a lot of more deer probably moving around opening day. They haven't been bugged. Um, not not too much, anyways. I mean, you'll have your archery hunters chase them around a little bit, but. Opening day, there's going to be a lot more people out in the woods, um, out on the prairie. Even if you're on public land, I mean, you're going to have those deer that are on the private properties being chased around, and um, that'll give you an opportunity on uh, some of the public land. If there isn't deer on there at that time, deer are going to be moving around regardless. Um, one, because of the rut, and two, because of other hunters uh, pressuring those animals and getting them moved around. So if you can find a good spot that looks like it has good good habitat you got your food your water cover um, get position I don't know find a good spot and sit down for a few hours that morning and just kind of watch and see what's all moving around 
So uh, you're sitting up on your high knob, whatever, or yep. river bank, and we can see out there a mile, two miles. Yep. What's your technique for finding game? Are you How are you scanning? How are you looking? And how are you, uh, maybe is, is it diff different, an initial scan versus coming back and looking? And we hear this, picking it apart. Yep. We pick that ground apart. What's that mean? Okay. Um, so for me personally, um, I'm either using my binoculars or also spotting scope. Depends on what kind of terrain I'm looking through and how far I'm looking out to. Um, I always start left to right um, and I work, I start farther away, glass that and kind of work myself in to a closer distance because you're going to want more patience and you're going to be moving slower with your binoculars or spotting scope the further you are away. Um, you just want to be more patient because it's a little harder to pick, pick things apart when it's at a mile, two miles rather than 500 yards. Um, you can pick through that pretty easily with a pair of binoculars. And, um, so yeah, I always start left to right and the further, furthest out, and then I move in. Um, I, if I'm using binoculars and I'm planning on glassing for quite a while, uh, it's always nice to have a tripod to, um, or by, yeah, tripod to throw up your binoculars on. It just kind of keeps it a little sturdier and a little Less weight Steel. holding up, yeah. yeah. When one thing is moving out there and not two things yep. moving, it seems to stick out there a little bit better. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and then as you go, your initial scan and look and, and, and trying to find that movement, what are what are areas that you're putting some extra focus on? Or are you putting a focus on yep. in certain areas? Yep. Um, I really, I mean, if I'm picking out like a, a draw, it's got a plum brush in it or anything like that. I mean, I, I spent quite a bit of time looking through that vegetation to try to find that antler tip or ears, um, just that little bit of movement. Um, then you're going through a lot of like the open prairie grass. I mean, you can move fairly fast through that kind of stuff, but um, those drainages and draws, that they can easily just be tucked away in and can't see their full body or you can only see half their face or something like that uh, just spend a little more time in those areas and then let's just say if you do spot an animal um, say it's a mile away really pick out some visu uh, um, visualizations for um, yourself as you're gonna go make that stock whether it's a specific tree um, big cottonwood down in the draw that they're gonna be just past that or if you can, if you have on X, you can always pull that up and kind of pinpoint on where that animal is, you think, and put a mark and use that as well. But you always use the best visualizations you can to try to, because once you get up there, it's going to look way different than it is a mile away when you're looking through it through glass. You're going to feel like you're either closer or further away from the animal. You can't really pick it apart as well. And you could be peeking over the hill in the wrong spot and it's yep. 500 yards away instead of 100. Yep, <laughs> exactly. And that's a matter of a, maybe being a shot or not, maybe. Yep. So. Yep. so even out on the prairie, wind is important. Always. Yep. If you're hunting any animal, always play the wind correctly. Uh, you got that buck bedded up in a draw, um, put that wind in your face and use the terrain that you can. Get yourself into position for a shot but yeah always make sure and try to play the wind correctly and get the wind in your favor before you go and make a stop because if that animal's smelling you he's going to be taken off before you even know that he took off when you get up to your right. place that you want to take your shot at so play your wind right so let's say you spotted a spotted a good buck doe whatever it is you're hunting yep. uh you spot him a little ways away half mile mile uh, and he's kind of on the move, just kind of moving. Do you, would you be looking at maybe getting in front of him and trying to make a play that way? Do you like to try and wait till they bed down? What are some tactics that, that you've seen folks use? And it's always going to depend on the sit, ah, it's always going to depend on the situation. Um, but if that animal is moving to an area that uh, you know that he's going to be in in a good position for a shot, then yes, I would try to get in front of him as long as my wind's going to be correct when I am in front of him or when I'm trying to get into position to get in front of him. Um, if 
he, if it's going to benefit me to just kind of stay on him, um, if I'm not going to be able to have a good clean shot um, where he's headed to, if I just kind of stick with him, um, kind of just dog him, I'll just try to get wait for that specific shot that he gives you. Um, just you know, kind of play it by ear, really. Yeah, I suppose there's times too that it's nice. Wide, wide open. Yeah. Maybe seeing where they go bed yep. and lay down. If it's something you just can't keep up, yep. catch up with. So, yep. all right. All right. All right. So we, we we found our deer, but but maybe we jumped him out of a, a draw of some sort, and yeah. he's on the move. Yeah. Um, there's a there's some folks that would be sending lead, and and maybe could be potentially kind of dangerous, and right. you're gonna maybe wound an animal. So, yep. kind of what's your take on on that situation? Uh, if I go in and I end up buffing that deer that I'm going after, uh, he takes off running. Me personally, I'm not a good shot when that deer is running and I don't like wounding animals. So I would, I just watch him, figure out where he's going. And if I'm hunting public, I hope that he stays on that piece of public junk and um, wait for that next opportunity and move in and hopefully make, make a good, clean, ethical shot. Um, that next position that he takes him to. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a big thing, and, and not just wounding the animal, but animal, but some safety. Uh, if you got something running up over a hill, make sure we're not having those skyline shots. And, yeah, well, uh, you're hunting, if you're hunting public land too, there's there's gonna be a lot of other hunters out there as well right. too. And so, yeah. need to be safe. Need yeah. to be safe, and and realize that that uh, just sending lead is probably not the best option. Maybe not worth worth that in the end. Maybe you can put a, a more rewarding stock on later on with that animal or keep up with him yep. or dog him like you said. Keep yeah. up with him and wait till wait till he gives you that shot that you're that you know you're comfortable with and you know that you can make. Or if it's a mule deer, maybe hop, hop, stop. Yep, always on a mule deer, always yeah. be ready because they like to take off like 20, 30 yards and stop to see what was that. Yeah, exactly. Well thanks for your time sir. Yeah, no problem. Thanks guys and good luck. All right, folks, so if there are any questions you got that are pressing or whatever, or not pressing, uh, here in the chat is my email address. Happy to help out with whatever kind of needs you have, as well as uh, other, if you're new to hunting, um, I run a program called Hunting 101 people through the paces on the entire process from A to Z on learning how to hunt from your hunter education to learning how to handle guns to uh, getting you out in the field if you have never done so before and getting you your first deer. Uh, it's kind of primarily what we focus on, but looking at doing some turkey hunting related stuff, we do some bow hunting as well. So there's uh, that. And uh, we have a whole host of other programs that we've got going on. Uh, I know for um, going backwards, December, I know we've got a ice fishing webinar or seminar, ice fishing seminar, seminar uh, that we've partnered with someone on. They're going to do a whole bunch of giveaways. So check that out for December. Uh, in November, we just got that scheduled out. There's a few things there. We are going to be doing a uh, pheasant hunt, um, pheasant or grouse hunt. I got it depends on the location. Doesn't matter to me. Here you go, hunt some upland birds. So uh, you folks are the only ones that probably know that right now. Um, it's not out there in the public yet. So we'll do a shooting day at the range and then we'll uh, go out the next month in December and go do the hunt. So um, that's got a couple weeks spread between it, but check that out. And if you can't find that, uh, I'm gonna make it public here pretty soon, um, very soon. Uh, and so maybe tomorrow. Make sure that that's public for you guys to find that. And uh, But we have a lot of opportunities. We're, we're here to help. And uh, the Outdoor Campus is not just a place for um, doing kid programs. We, we do a lot of family programs, and that's what we're focused on, and, and helping you guys all become or continue to be outdoor sportsmen and women. So uh, thanks again for you all ch chiming in. I'll post this on YouTube down the road. So you can share that. And that's actually going to be posted on South Dakota Game Fishing Park's 
education. Uh, Google doesn't like us, so uh, you got to go into YouTube and type in South Dakota Game Fishing Parks education. That education part has to be on there. So uh, as the winter months come come up and hunting season wraps up uh, at the end of December, there I'll be doing. We'll be doing a lot more virtual stuff, so that'll be an option. Anyway. Thank you all for chiming in. Don't see any questions coming in at all. So we will uh, let you guys have a good night. Thank you.